All right, I think we're, uh, we're about ready to uh, get underway. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming out today on this beautiful uh, June day. My name is Jason Sagedy. I'm the chairman of the Northeast Ohio Sustainable uh, Communities Consortium. Uh, I'd like to uh, extend a special welcome to all the officials that are here today from Youngstown and Mahoning and Trumbull uh, counties. Really appreciate the hospitality. Thank you to the city of Youngstown for uh, providing this space for us. Uh, to meet in this beautiful facility. And uh, for the board members that were on the tour this mor morning speaking, I think on behalf of all of us, it was really um, a great tour to be able to see some neighborhoods in Youngstown, to go out into the community, to take a look at Mill, Mill Creek Park, and also um, end up with a really nice tour at the Butler Museum of Art. So uh, thank you again to both uh, Hunter and your staff and all those that uh, made this morning happen. Um, for those of you that may not be aware, we've been meeting um, in Summit County for really since the board meetings began. This is our first uh, meeting of our 12 counties in 12 months uh, world tour of Northeast Ohio. So uh, thank you again, Mahoning County, for, uh, for hosting us. Before uh, I got going with introductions, I just wanted to see if there was anyone um, from the Mahoning Valley as far as elected officials or otherwise that were... Uh, interested in, in addressing the group or, or speaking. I wanted to give you the opportunity to do so. I guess I will. Yeah, Glenn Hall's mayor, Josie McDonald, uh, president of the Mahoney River Mayor's Association. I appreciate you guys being here. Someone instrumental in helping uh, formulate this group and excited about the direction you guys are going. Thank you very much. Uh, hey, go ahead. State Rep. Sean O'Brien, just welcome everyone. I think it's important that we all get together and uh, thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Mike Gray, 4 4 Council with the City of Youngstown. I think you may have passed through there today on the uh, tour if you went through Mill Creek Park. Uh, again, welcome to Youngstown. We're excited about this group and excited to work with you. Great. Thanks a lot. Okay, as, uh, as is per our usual practice, I think if we could uh, maybe, Bill, start with you. We'll just go around the table and introduce ourselves. Uh, and if you could just say your affiliation and which work stream on the project you're affiliated with. I'm uh, Bill Davignon with the City of Youngstown. I am with the uh, Quality Connected Places Work Stream. Bill Miller with the Trumbull County Planning Commission on the same work stream. Pam Hawkins, Acting Metropolitan Housing Authority, Housing Community. Rachel McCartney, East Bay Regional Council of Governments, co chair of the Environments Work Stream. Sarah Meyer, Nawaka, co chair of the Connections Work Stream. Brad Chase, Clue Museum of Natural History. I'm on the uh, Communications uh, Committee as well as the Connections. John Bitterholzer with the Fund for Economic Future. I'm voting today for Brad Whitehead, um, and I'm the co-chair of the environmental workshop. Mike Lyons uh, with the Regional Prosperity Initiative, uh, co-chairing uh, communications and engagement. Uh, Brian Corbin from the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown. I'm with the engagement. Nancy Cook with the City of Akron. I'm here for Mark Moore, uh, who's on the economic work stream. Uh, Tom Terrell, I'm Chair of Great Lakes Biomimicry. I'm Secretary of NEOSCC and I'm Representative for RPI as Vice Chair of RPI. I'm Dan Mamula. I'm the Morning River Port Orange Initiative Manager, Delegate from Honing County, and Vice Chair, and I work with the Environments Work, work Stream. Uh, again, I'm Jason Sagedy. I'm the Director of the a Akron Metropolitan Area Transportation Study, which is the <coughs> Metropolitan Planning Organization serving uh, Greater Akron, and I'm also on the Quality Connected Places Work Stream. Hunter Morrison, director of the consortium and a member of the um, Quality Connected Places Work Stream. I'm Peggy Carlo, Asheville County Commissioner, and I'm on the board and the quality. Angie Byington, alternate for Elyria's mayor, Brenda. Um, I'm on the environmental stream. Hi, uh, my name is Donna Scott with Summit County Public Health, and I'm on the connections and the economic. Emily Campbell from the Center for Community Solutions on Quality Connected Places and Housing and Communities Work Streams. Hi, um, my name is Anna Diasenis. I'm here on behalf of John McNally, Mahoney County Commissioner, and I'm working on the housing work stream. I'm uh, Fred Collier, Chief City Planning, Cleveland City Planning Commission, on the Quality Connected uh, Places Work Stream, Housing and Communities, and the Jay. Fred Wright, President, Studio Akron Urban, the co chair of the community engagement. Communication. I'm Ed Jarrett, Director of Regional Collaboration for Cuyahoga County, and I'm a member of the Economic Development Work Stream. Well, 
uh, short <coughs> Spent State University, the Center for Urban Regional Studies, and Economic Development Work Stream. I'm Stuart Mandel. I'm at Cleveland State University. I'm Assistant Dean for the College of Urban Affairs and the Director of the Urban Center. And with the quality of the connected places. Okay, thank, thank you all. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Joe Hadley, Director of the Northeast Ohio Fork County Regional Planning and Development Organization. Remember the environments uh, John Getchew, the Executive Director of the State Regional Council of Governments and Co Chair of the Connection Group. George Barrett, I'm the <coughs> alternate for the Youngtown Catholic Diocese, and I'm working on the uh, uh, Housing and Communities Work Stream. Uh, Bob Now, the director of the Clark County Regional Planning Commission, and I am uh, a co-chair of the Housing and Communities. Jeff Dutton with the Stark County Area Transportation Study, which is the uh, MPO in Stark County, uh, and uh, working on the Connections Board. Uh, Patty Stevens with Cleveland Metro Parks, and I'm on the Environment Office. Any other? board members lurking in the shadows. <laughs> okay. Um, th we're going to have a pretty full agenda today, and definitely the highlight is the uh, the conditions and trends platform, so I'll try to keep us uh, moving along up until uh, that point. The next order of business is public comment. I believe there's at least one public comment that I'm aware of. Um, so if you'd like to come up uh, to the front, probably be most effective, just up to the podium there um, in if you could keep it to around five minutes, but uh, the floor is all yours. Sure, thank you. Um, my name is Lance Triggs, and uh, I'm an officer with a new nonprofit organization called Energy Ohio Network. I have uh, another colleague, uh, Mike Giesing, here, and uh, a collaborator, Andrew Thomas, who's a director and um, executive in residence at the uh, College of Urban Affairs for, Co for Cleveland State and the uh, Center for Energy Policy. The reason we wanted to come here today was to just introduce um, or have a coming out kind of announcement um, in front of a group that we think fits um, extremely well with a collaborative approach that we are looking at in regards to the energy side. Essentially, um, we are focused on bringing together Ohio's energy practitioners, including citizens, businesses, and NGOs and uh, not-for-profit organizations to basically help Ohio realize the full benefits of the current energy opportunities in the best path possible in the future. And I have to apologize with the number of parties here. We do have some uh, copies of uh, one-page um, summaries that I'm basically reading from. Uh, Mike can pass some of those around, or if you have ability to, I think we have about 20 copies. So we will leave those. Um, for parties that might be interested. And, and I'm sorry, Lance, I was gonna say, if you wanna email it to me maybe after this too, I can make sure it gets circulated to everyone else. Super. Um, we are uh, actively um, growing our membership right now, and we continue to do that with meetings down in Columbus and other portions of the state. We are located from a focus right now of the practitioners and the founders up in Northeast Ohio. Um, we are basically looking to do uh, three general focus areas. One is developing, supporting, and acting on a regional strategy for leveraging low-cost shale energy and distributed generation opportunities as a lead towards improving the environment and quality of life in Ohio and reestablishing Northeast Ohio as a global and sustainable manufacturing powerhouse. We're looking to understand and report to the general public and policymakers and energy practitioners how energy sources, technologies, and policies can lead to sustainable economic and environmental future for Ohioans. And this will entail basically developing a, a knowledge base of information and research. Um, and then position Ohio as an innovator in energy as we already are in many areas and leveraging the state's um, natural resources and deep roots in workforce and manufacturing and our innovative spirit to help reinvent the U.S. and Ohio energy sector. Um, we do believe that Ohio has the resources right now and the opportunity to really do a uh, industrial revolution 2.0 in Northeast Ohio and the rest of the manufacturing areas of the state. And that is a focus of what this working group would do. Um, we are collaborative and we are outside of all the silos. So 
Um, we're essentially looking to take um, all the different energy sectors, bring them together in a collaborative approach to, to uh, find the best path forward for Ohio. Um, with that, um, like I said, there's a one-page handout. Um, we do have um, CSU as a collaborative partner right now through their um, Center for Energy Policy. We look at policy research and information as being a very, very valuable component of this outside of the venue of advocacy but actually acting upon that information when it's independently developed. So um, Andrew Thomas actually uh, was uh, one of the co-authors of the Economic Potential for Shale Development in Ohio. That was jointly done also with OSU and Marietta College. Um, and I wanted to give him an opportunity to talk about uh, his perspective as an expert in the field and also the opportunity for um, the uh, energy field in the uh, next uh, 21st century. Hi, I'm Andrew Thomas. I'm with Cleveland State University, and actually Stuart is my boss, and he and I didn't talk, <laughs> so I had no idea he was going to be here or he was even in this, involved in this organization. Um, <laughs> but uh, I did want to just tell you a little bit about what we're doing at Cleveland State. We started this Energy Policy Center up a couple years ago. Uh, in, in uh, the, in my view, at least initially, it was the critical need that we felt was uh, as the technology is coming forward, that technology, new technology in the energy business is not being adopted very quickly and it's primarily uh, due to regulatory and institutional impediments. And uh, this is uh, becoming more true than ever right now as we're looking at how natural gas is going to revolutionize Northeast Ohio. And so what, what we, uh, when, from my discussions with a number of people in the industry, and, uh, and these are all organizations who are now members of, of this new group that we've put together, um, what we have found is that, that uh, what we are facing is some fundamental changes in the way we get electricity. I don't know if you all watched what happened in the auction recently with the PJM market, but uh, Northeast Ohio is three times the rate of the rest of the PJM whole entire region. And this is going to translate into a, uh, higher cost electricity for us and the capacity charges. Uh, and the way around this is distributed generation. And distributed generation, of course, relies on natural gas. And we have the ample capability right now of, of making that move in Ohio, as we also have the ability to move into CNG for automobiles and also to adopt uh, other distributed generations like wind and solar as well. Uh, but it requires some, some thinking of how we're going to approach all this. And so what we had offered up to, the, um, to the group, new, this new group, E.ON, is that we would uh, provide for them uh, regulatory research and related uh, institutional research to, to help them develop ideas of how we might be able to go forward uh, with a plan in Ohio that you know, we can offer up to policymakers to use as they see fit. So that's basically what we're trying to accomplish. And I think we're well on the road already now for it, but obviously collaboration with this group would be something that would uh, help significantly in, in our efforts. So with that, uh, I think that's all we had to say. Andy and Lance, thanks both for uh, coming out and I think letting us know that you were out there and, and uh, I think, think it would make sense for us to uh, talk further as time goes on about ways we might be able to collaborate. Were there any questions just real quickly before we move on? Did, did you leave us your contact information? Uh, I have not, but I can leave a card with you and certainly Stuart knows how to find me. <laughs> thanks a lot. Thank Okay, uh, before we move on to um, the next order of business, I did want to recognize uh, Howard Mayer, because I, Howard, not to put you on the, slot, uh, on the spot, but uh, this is Howard's last, at least official, uh, meeting as no ACA representative. He's going to be retiring uh, at the end of the month, and uh, I just wanted to recognize him for his long service at NOACA and for NOACA's role uh, in this consortium, their very important role, not only as one of the founders, but being willing to be the fiscal agent for the project, which is a pretty thankless job, I think, in a lot of cases. So I don't know, Howard, if you wanted to say anything else, but I wanted to recognize you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll, I'll never pass up an opportunity to say something. <laughs> but uh, uh, we're very, very pleased and very proud to be part of this organization. Uh, 
it's great to have been at the, uh, the initiation of it when Jason and John Getchy and Bob Now and I had conversations. Well, what can we do? Uh, well, we saw the, uh, uh, the NOFA first come out, and uh, it's just wonderful to see what's happened. And, uh, so congratulations to everybody. Uh, I want to uh, give a special uh, shout out to Sarah Meyer, spelled the same way, just pronounced a little differently from our staff, who has uh, uh, really done a tremendous job in representing NOACA uh, uh, on behalf of uh, uh, NEOS. So thanks, Sarah. And thanks to, to you, uh, Jason and, and Hunter. Uh, we wish you great success. This is a tremendous concept, a tremendous project. Uh, we are uh, trailblazers nationwide, and it's really great to be part of something like this. Thanks a lot, Howard. Okay, uh, next order of business, we are at uh, item 3A on the agenda, which is approval of the minutes of the May meeting. I believe they were distributed in your, uh, in your packet. And uh, with that, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Got a motion? Second, <laughs> Second Mr. Lyons. Uh, any discussion, corrections, comments? If not, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thanks. Uh, next order of business, item 3B, which is a presentation of current financials and budget. And I'll turn the floor over to Emma Barcelona. So everybody in your packets, you have three pieces of information. You have our current expenditures. If you received an email last week, we adjusted it slightly. So the one you have in front of you is correct. These are our expenditures, uh, column B, through the end of May. Um, you'll see that... Uh, that your contribution as far as the consortium membership is also included there as far as your match at just over $800,000 at this point. Additionally, you have our cash position. Um, I wanted to bring your attention to this in particular because uh, it was in May that we conducted or we uh, completed a large draw from HUD. Uh, per their request and how we'll be proceeding forward from now on is that any time a contract is approved by this body, we will be drawing the full amount of obligation into our account. So you'll see there that our receipts um, are, is a larger amount than we actually spent last month. And that will continue and as the program goes on, of course, we'll draw less from HUD as we'll have it on hand and we'll pay out on our obligations and contracts <coughs> with that. Additionally, you have the attachment here. Um, of course, you'll be discussing further the action um, later in this meeting, uh, but the contract status is attached, so you can see our obligations to date, how we've paid out on our contracts, and the status of open contracts. Uh, and then, of course, we have some pending activity moving forward. Uh, indeed, at this point, we have not received any word to the contrary, but HUD did accept our our plan for expenditures for the rest of the next 18 months thereabout on how we'll be spending. And in that, it includes the um, need for us to uh, draw down and expend um, larger contracts in the coming months, in the next two quarters in particular, that will then, of course, be based on activity that will be, um, we'll be conducting over the next 18 months. Finally, I wanted to note that the audit is complete uh, prior to the next executive committee meeting. So in two weeks, we'll be inviting the auditors meet in more for about an hour prior to the meeting to, for anybody that's interested in getting the full breakdown of the audit and the tax return. The auditors will be present at our next board meeting for you know 10 or 15 minutes to go over the overall board presentation on the audit for your acceptance, if you so choose to accept the audit. But indeed, if you're interested in understanding um, our the fiscal activity and any, any other activities for the last fiscal year, FY11, that'll be prior to the next executive committee meeting. Are there any questions I can answer at this time regarding expenditures or budget? Oh, finally, I apologize. With the um, changing or the, the, the modifications that we'll be making with our activity, we are uh, working on changing the budget. So as that is prepared and ready, hopefully by the next board meeting, we'll have that so that we can then submit it to HUD for their approval to move forward. The total amount of expenditures is not changing. Um, it might be the line items, it might be the activities that we're funding um, as a result of some of these modifications, but beyond that there's no um, uh, monumental change with those. All right, well, please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Emma.
All right, the uh, next order of business, item four, uh, report on the board of directors and executive committee. Uh, that, that would be me. Uh, I can keep this pretty brief. Uh, the executive committee has continued to do some of what we've been calling foundation work uh, with, uh, with the consulting firm uh, Curary that we hired uh, earlier this year, basically kind of reevaluating. Many of you are aware, I think, that if you know about the history of the consortium, um, Howard mentioned there was a NOFA. We put in an application. We were pleased to see that we received the funding. We went through kind of a process to ramp things up and create an organization uh, from scratch. We brought Hunter on. He was a huge part of you know doing everything from getting furniture to figuring out where we're going to have an office. And uh, some of the foundation work's been an opportunity to kind of reassess where we are, how we're organized, uh, and so forth. So that work is continuing to go on at the executive committee. Uh, level with with our partner Curary, uh, and I think we'll probably have more to report on at, at the July meeting. Um, I'd be glad to entertain any questions if you have any, or you can call me after the meeting to kind of find out more about uh, what's going on with that. Uh, if there aren't any questions on that, I think I'll go ahead and keep us moving along and turn it over to Sarah to uh, give a report on the membership agreements and leverage match. Um, in your packages, you have information on the 30 <coughs> consortium members that are involved in this project, and also the leverage match that totals to about $800,000 um, reported so far. You'll see that there are some um, entities that are behind in submitting their leverage match forms. Um, so please, as always, get those in. Okay, thanks. All right, next, uh, next order of business is uh, the 2012 Board and Executive Committee meeting schedule. I mentioned this is the first of our 12 counties in 12 months uh, meeting schedule. Uh, I'll turn things over to uh, Hunter and Jeff just maybe to talk a little bit more about the, uh, the next board meeting. All right, Mr. Chairman, this is our first on-the-road trip, and uh, we've been working with the uh, folks here to, to make it a, a robust day, and I think we're, being, we're doing the same thing in Lorraine County uh, in anticipation of a similar type of, uh, of event. Uh, certainly Jeff and I would appreciate any feedback uh, which we get to the committee as to what's working and, and what might be improved upon. But I really do appreciate the work of the local committee uh, to do to put this day together. Jeff, did you want to say anything further? Um, just, I, I don't think we could have started with a better day than today. I think this morning, you know, there was a great deal of sharing going on and, and understanding of some of the challenges and opportunities here in Youngstown. And I think that is really at the core of what this is all about in terms of getting out of our comfort areas and traveling across the region. I can say, and I think this was confirmed by Mayor Brinda yesterday, I'm looking at Angie, is that we do have uh, confirmation that we're going to have a meeting in Marion County at the newly renovated and addition high school the state of the art high school in uh, the city of Valeria on uh, June 20, July 24th. So um, we're also working with Don Romanchik and Mike Challenger uh, and other things to happen that day during Lorraine County. So I would just say, if I forget it later, thanks to Youngstown and Mahoney County. And I think you set the bar pretty high for the next uh, So thanks. I think, I think Team Lorraine County is up for it, don't you think? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. We'll get a little fr <coughs> friendly competition in the region. Uh, next item, just really an announcement. Uh, the next executive committee meeting will be held uh, July 10th uh, at 1.30, uh, the eighth floor of the city center building in, in downtown Akron at the uh, NEOSCC offices. Uh, I imagine an agenda will probably be going out in the next uh, couple days for that meeting. If there are items of interest that you, you would like to get uh, on the executive committee, Agenda, you could let me know and I'll, I'll pass those along uh, to the staff. All right, we're at uh, item number five, the program ma uh, management office report. Uh, the first item was just a real quick report out by me. Uh, you might recall if you were at the uh, May uh, board meeting in Hudson that there was a motion uh, approved to uh, embark upon a search for uh, some additional capacity to help uh, execute on some of the day-to-day -day project management in the office, uh, some of the tactical uh, support that we might need. So uh, I worked with a group of a couple people on an ad hoc committee to put together a posting for what we were calling a director of operations. 
Uh, that posting, I believe, runs through this week. And uh, am I right on that, Sarah? It, 19th was the date that was put on there more open, or until closed. Okay, so it's still, still out there. Um, and basically what we've been looking at resumes of people that might be able to help uh, in some fashion, either a consulting firm or individuals, um, to help with some of the day-to-day -day management of the project and the tactical execution of what's in the work plan. Some of it could involve um, fleshing out more what's in the work plan. Uh, I think that our strategy, at the, we talked about this at the last executive committee meeting, was to uh, see what's out there and then decide you know, who or what firm, if any, would be uh, meeting our needs. I imagine this discussion will probably be a big part of the uh, the July uh, executive committee agenda. So we don't have any action before the board today, but I just wanted to give you uh, an update on where that stands right now. Um, with that, we'll move on to item 5-2, which is, me, sure, said, go ahead, Fred. You said uh, look for a person or a firm for the operations. Uh, either. Either or. Yeah. Yeah, it was writ written as a very uh, open-ended posting, I think, to give us maximum flexibility and seeing, having a better understanding of what our needs might be and then looking at the uh, potential applicants who might fit the profile best. Uh, any, any other? Yeah, we should have that out to all of the board members and all the other different groups around the, around the, uh, on the website. Yeah, it's actually, it is posted on the website, on the project website, and it's also on NOACA's website. And uh, people that are interested in uh, wanting to help out can, um, there's instructions for the application basically, or their resume to go to NOACA, care of uh, myself as the chair. Any, uh, any other questions on that? Okay. Uh, next item was on uh, on the budget and uh, work plan, and I'll, I'll turn this over to uh, to the staff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as, as Emma Barcelona noted, uh, we have been uh, uh, updating and readjusting the, the budget, and I believe we'll be in a position at the July meeting to present that. The other the other thing that has uh, been on our on our plate uh, in the last month or so has been to modify the work plan to reflect the, the thoughts that have come forward out of the, uh, the core work that uh, Jason mentioned uh, and the refocusing of activities on uh, products and processes. Uh, we are going to have to um, adjust the work plan uh, accordingly and present that uh, to HUD along with the, sort of the correspondence of how we go from well, what we proposed before to where we are now and the schedule that goes along with that. So that's been a key part of our our efforts over the last uh, month, and we expect to be in a position to report on that, John. Great. Uh, any further items on that, Hunter? Uh, okay. Is there anything else we need to do? Okay. No. Okay. Thanks a lot. Well, that takes us to uh, to item six, which is kind of the uh, the highlight of our agenda, and I'm personally very excited to uh, to see this rolled out. Uh, we've had discussions <laughs> ongoing at, at, at the last couple meetings about. Uh, this conditions and trends platform, uh, what it is and how it could help us. And uh, I don't want to steal the thunder of those who will be uh, presenting it. So with that, I will uh, we'll turn it over to, uh, to Jeff to uh, start to take us through uh, the launch. Well, Mr. Mr. Chairman, before that, I just wanted to, uh, to note that this is the first of uh, the core uh, products that have come out of uh, the staff and the, uh, the work streams. Uh, this represents countless hours of work on behalf of the members of the, of the group. Uh, personally, I want to thank uh, Joe Hadley and Mike Lyons for being the, the uh, tireless editing committee uh, for, our, for our project. But it really does represent a most unique and, uh, and uh, significant starting point. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, as I was ex just expressing to, to Mike Lyons in the middle of all this, this is really the first time this region has attempted to come to, con to a level of consensus about it, the facts uh, on the ground and the trends that are affecting us all and to do so in a way that's uh, uh, both uh, sensitive to, to, to the nuances of language uh, and, and focused on the challenges we have in front of us. Uh, and I also want to, to, to thank the Our Strategies team uh, for, again, hanging in there and working through the editing process, which, which has been a, a thoughtful and thorough one. 
Uh, it is the first of several of these foundation pieces of the work. The next piece we hope to be in a position at the July meeting to, to talk about in greater detail is the region-wide parcel-based land use and zoning maps, which have been put together by our the GIS uh, uh, organizations uh, in our four MPOs and in uh, Coward, Coward County. But that's, that'll be, that's for next month's thunder. Let me turn it over to Jeff to talk about the, the, uh, the contents of this most important work. There, I can see a little better now. I guess. <laughs> no, you're fine. You're fine. Um, well, I think before we dive into the actual site, um, it's always, I, I think, critically important to understand because we've talked about the platform so much now that perhaps we've lost a little bit of, of really what it's launching to. And I think that was part of the reason that we selected the word platform is that this is really the launch to not only our public engagement, which we will talk about later in this meeting, but also for further study and analysis as we develop you know, a regional vision and our goals and objectives for our, our work plan um, that will fuel the different tools that we talk about in terms of our dashboard, in terms of the toolkit, policy, pilot projects. This, uh, what we're going to show you today, really is just setting the foundation from there. And it's really what we're going to build on to go forward. And as Hunter said, it was a pretty exhaustive effort getting to this point. And um, we'll show you on the, the website itself, I think we had over 150 different organizations, organizations, not just people, organizations throughout Northeast Ohio working on this from all areas of subject matter, from the environment to economic development, to transportation, to housing. Um, and I think you'll see a lot of that in our work here today. Um, this is something, as we talked about at the May meeting, is really a launching point and is an evolving tool. So there's changes that we can make tomorrow. We can add, we can subtract, we can build on it. The public can inform it. Uh, they can actually participate in building it, as you'll see in the asset list um, piece that we have here. But really, fundamentally, I think this sets the groundwork for us to move forward. And it was a necessary step to kind of understand the conditions and trends on the ground. And um, I know that there's a little bit of weariness in terms of talking about this and wanting to get on to the next step, but this was an important one to take. And also, I think an important one to show the collaboration across the region to move forward into kind of solution development, because uh, it was critical to kind of develop some of the relationships that we've developed in, in putting the platform together. And uh, I think it, it goes without saying that those relationships will be critical as we move forward into the different parts of the planning process. So, Mike, there was going to be indoor fireworks, but then John Getchy moved me into this room out of the arena, so we just decided to scrap the indoor fireworks. Oop. Yeah, just double click on it. And here we are at the Conditions and Trends platform. Um, this again is um, <clears throat> the reason it's a platform and it's online was just because we want it to be a living and involving document. Um, we are working on a short two to four page executive summary that will be published probably in the next week or two. But the impetus for this was that we didn't want it to be something that was outdated the next day. So uh, we took particular uh, attention and focus to developing an online presence that not only presents our work but also is an interactive place where people can comment and help us build our work in the future. So what you're seeing here now is the home page of the platform. And like any other website home page, it has some pull down and drop down menus to go through in different ways. And so what I thought we would do today is just kind of take a quick glance at some of the different features, and then we can look at the different themes in a little bit more detail as we go forward. Um, because I'm really, really excited about maybe having a meeting that goes from one to three today and <laughs> looking at <laughs> Chairman Manuel there, Vice Chair Manuel. So, so on the home page itself, um, if you look at the, the gray arrow there to the, to the left in the left-hand column, the overview, the overview is um, a, a letter to the region from NEOSCC that encapsulates what our initiative is about, what we see some of the challenges on the ground, what some of the findings are in terms of how we are viewing them and how we're going to take a look at working together to develop new opportunities and solutions going forward. And then it's also a call to action, a call for the region, no matter if you're a resident, uh, an elected official, um, an agency official, or anyone else in the region that's a stakeholder, 
that you can get involved in this. And Patty will be explaining later about our community engagement plan. But we'll also be going out and meeting with elected officials and other agency officials throughout the 12 counties. And so this kind of serves as our, as our uh, welcome and almost challenge to them to kind of get involved with us and develop solutions together. Can I maybe go back? There we go. So if you scroll down a little bit, um, at the executive committee meeting a couple weeks ago, it was pressed to us, and I think rightfully so, that we needed to kind of present a, 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 an FAQ of what this document is. And so this intro on the homepage basically talks about what this is and what it isn't. Um, it is a platform, but not a political platform. It is a place where um, all of our findings are based on data and are, are, uh, have been analyzed for their truthfulness. <laughs> And so there's no conclusions drawn. Basically, what we've done is just present the findings as our work streams found them um, throughout the 12 counties on the different issues in different work stream areas. Um, as you scroll towards the bottom, you will see that, um, again, you can access the NAOSC letter to the region. You can also take a look at um, uh, our list of community assets. This is something that the Quality Connected Places work stream is working hard on to identify assets throughout the 12 counties. And um, what we've developed today is based on um, some preliminary work and some of their preliminary listings in terms of listing the assets throughout the 12 counties. I think there's over 250 of them that we listed now, um, along with hyperlinks to those assets. So as we develop plans, and we talked about it today on the tour, when we are going past the park and, and building off assets within the region, this will become a critical part of how we develop our plans going forward. This is also going to be an entree point for um, citizens engagement, which we will involve them in, in suggesting assets to add to the list. The asset list will also then get kind of organized a little bit better. This is one of the things that we really didn't get to uh, in order to launch this today. Can I go back? Any questions thus far? Am I going too fast, too slow? <laughs> Um, underneath that is, uh, during the course of our research, uh, Joe McDonald in particular put together a list of 144 different plans, regional plans that were developed, economic development plans, environmental plans, transportation plans uh, throughout the 12 counties. And uh, what we've developed here is a search engine that you could search throughout those plans to find different data or different data points that you're looking for. This is something that, as a tool, uh, based part of the platform will be developed further as we go along. So you'll not only be able to look at the plans, but also look at some of our findings and kind of have a, a combination website on some of them. Um, but again, it's about documenting what's been done in the past so that we understand and can build off some of the successes in the past. And this is something, it's in a different form. We've had this on the website for the last couple months, and there's been a lot of visitors to that area to kind of just peruse the database of plans. So, um, Mike, if you want to go up a little bit, and we'll finish. On the left um, over here are all the uh, different ways that you can navigate through um, the website, including some overall themes, which we'll get to in a second, and our different work stream areas. Um, our work stream areas, if, for those not familiar with our work, are economic development, the environment, housing and communities, connections or transportation, and quality connected places. So what you'll start to see here is that we have developed an organizational structure where you can look at our findings, not only by the work streams, but also kind of rolled up into the themes and start to see the bigger picture and bigger narrative across the 12 counties. Um, in the right-hand margin is a way for people to log in and create a login identity so that they can interact with the site and post comments and be part of the community as we build the site. Uh, Jeff, I, I tried doing it yesterday and, and what, wasn't a lot of complete. Today. Yeah, because it was in its build state yesterday, so we weren't allowing people to sign up yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for trying, though, Howard. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Um, also, in the right-hand margin, you'll see um, a, a Did You Neo program. This is something that I've been talking about for a long time. Um, it's going to be part of a campaign, kind of informing the public about some of the choices that we've made in the past, as well as informing them about some of our successes. And so what we've done here in the launch today is listed like 10 different facts and figures around population dec decline, about the increase of land that we're using and land that we're developing, um, the lessening of the ratio of people per acre in the region as we've grown out. We've gotten smaller in terms of 
our population. And then some other things in terms of um, single drives in, in automobiles. Um, what else is at the bottom there? I can't read it from here, Mike. Um, ground field, ground field sites, yeah. 10%. And this is something that I think is going to be important to, to pull out from our findings, some facts and figures that you can share, uh, particularly with the, with the public. I presented uh, last week at YSU to a, to a group of high school teachers, and it was, it was a fantastic experience because it was the first time that we actually had the data and the maps together. So I was able to kind of tell our story, and you know, their jaws just dropped when you talked about housing and transportation costs, uh, the amount of... Um, people uh, in the region that has declined where we've grown by 33 percent and so it was very interesting for them to kind of see it in visual form uh, but this again will be another way to kind of communicate it in a in a shorter form so um, why don't we do the atlas real quick before we go into the themes another tool and this really came out of the mind of of mike thomas here um, is the northeast ohio map atlas um, this is an atlas of all the different maps that we put together in order to deliver the project. So under news and resources, you can go to this whole Oops. library of map. Oh, I hope I don't have anything up there strange. But, but again, you can go through the whole library of maps that we've created for this and take a look at um, different things around population, around health, around affordable housing, around housing and transportation around the amount of green space in the region, around brownfields, uh, and other economic development costs. Um, this again will be something that we will build as a database. Right now they're really just, I don't think they're all tagged yet for all the different identifiers to search on. But this is a great repository to start um, building our database and how we move forward. And of course, an important part of what we're doing is not only the vision that we're creating for the region, but really enabling the region to have the tools to make better decisions. And I think this is a great first step in doing that. Are those all 12 county based? Um, the majority of them, a couple of them are a little bit larger than 12 counties, but the majority of them are 12 county based. There are a few that are just maps of Cuyahoga County. They were right. Oh, yeah. And there's a couple that we pinpointed into certain parts of the region, particularly around health issues, right. where we still need to see if those same kind of trends within Cuyahoga County are, are in effect in some of the other parts of the region. So, uh, But the majority of them are based on 12 counties. Um, so there, there even could be a, a little bit of layover that we, that we work into later in this. But uh, again, this is a tool that we will develop as we go. Questions before we go into the themes? Um, so as I said earlier, uh, we have these five work streams that have been working uh, extremely hard over the last six months to six to eight months. And just taking a look at conditions on the ground and each of them were comprised of 30 to 40 volunteers from different organizations throughout the 12 counties really focused on their subject matter area and taking a look at those that subject matter and saying well what is it connected to land use that some of the issues that we're seeing are and how is it that uh, the trends are affecting the region and um, and even begin to look at you know what is it that we need to do in order to improve the region so um, the findings here today are really a culmination of all that work. And Mike, if you want to go into maybe economic development first. The work stream? Yeah, why don't we do the work stream first? I'm talking in that direction. So um, each of the work stream areas carries um, probably six to ten different findings that are subject matter related to them. Um, in economic development, they range from things around incentives uh, for project locations to not really understanding the total or complete cost of uh, project development as well as looking at land use and economic development and um, and how that affects the process so if you want to open one of the findings maybe so in this first one um, that really maybe Mike why don't you talk about this since you can see it a little better <laughs> okay well um, the first one has to do with uh, employment growth and Strengths in drivers and driver industries, and you can see the we've included a number of graphs explaining that finding, um, along with text that uh, goes into detail on what is in each graphic. Um, all the supporting documentation for each finding is found on a single page uh, that's related to that finding. So you can see there's a lot of information here, and that's true on virtually all of these. 
Do you want to walk them through maybe um, the magnification of the of the graphics? Oh, sure. Just click on it. Up it comes. And then you can also take a look at all of the graphics going forward, just doing a, a forward. So it's almost like a, a mini PowerPoint that you can present. Anthony? Can you download it from that site, or do you have to go to the app location, or is that app? I think you could probably download a very low-res JPEG off of it, but I don't think you could download the actual image yet. Not yet, but we'll, it, yeah, we'll it's be coming. There yeah, yeah. There's a lot of things, and and as you guys know from the last board meeting, you know this has been a, a work in progress, and this was a good place to kind of pull the curtain back and and start using it. But there's a lot of features that we'll be adding in the next couple of weeks to to enrich that experience. So, uh, add a download button right now. People can just right click and save the image and if they want to, if they want to do that. Where did this information all come from? Um, <laughs> the economic development information I think a lot of it came from um, some of the Team Neo work and some of the Jobs Ohio work. Um, I'm not certain the individual citations on, I mean each of them are cited in terms of, of their source document. This was work prepared, I believe this is the work prepared um, under the direction of Ned Hill at the request of Jobs Ohio as part of the effort to do a Northeast Ohio economic development strategy. So we were benefited, uh, quite frankly, by a serendipitous uh, synchronicity here between our work and theirs. And as, as they release more of theirs, I think they're going back through some of this, we, I believe, will be adding additional data points. And on this one, Ed, it's the OSU Center for, it's hard for me to read. CSU. 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 Pardon uh, CSU. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and primarily a lot of, uh, we didn't really perform any primary research to get this done. I think most of the research was done already. Um, we did invest in a little bit of research and data for this from the Center for Neighborhood Technologies, but otherwise it really came from common sources here throughout the region. So each of the work streams are kind of set up like this into um, findings and then drilling down deeper into the findings. Um, you can also um, uh, view the, all this information by the themes and maybe might go back to the home page and we can look at the description of the themes. Sure. Any questions as we're bumping through? So the themes, um, this was something that uh, as we brought our strategy on board and as we were taking a look at the online report function of this, we were kind of uh, blown away by the amount of data and the amount of different maps and different kind of findings across all of the work streams. And so we started taking a look at that and tried to examine, well, what are some of the themes that are coming out of that? And what is some of the themes that are relative to our work that will really help us kind of focus and bring some of these different work streams together. Um, because <coughs> as a sustainability consortium, it's important not just to look at these things in the silos of economic development or the environment, but really kind of try to bring them together and see, well, what is sprawl? And how is kind of the extending of our building affecting health, affecting housing, affecting transportation, and affecting economic development? And how best can we kind of bring that together? So really, these themes today that we've come up with are both uh, themes and findings of, of things that we need to work on and things that we need to celebrate. The first one, assets and resources, is a mixture of things that uh, we could take pride in in terms of assets of the region as we showed you the asset map, but also um, some of the resources that are being challenged as we go forward in terms of some of our, our groundwater and, and lakes, rivers, and streams. Um, the asset and resources also includes one of the first products that the consortium put together, uh, which was the regional land use map. If you want to click on that. The very first one. And this was a product that, again, came together through a very unique and for the first time collaboration uh, across the 12 counties to really develop a regional land use map. And uh, as Hunter mentioned, and Anthony is really working on with a lot of the MPO staff and, and Bob now and his staff, um, we're really focused, on the next deliverable will be a 12 county zoning map, which again, kind of parallels this one in a lot of ways. And then it'll be 
up to us to kind of figure out how can we best make these into products that can be usable at the ground level. So, um, uh, maybe go back to the um, back to the themes, and we'll just bump through the rest of the themes. Um, some of the other themes include population decline and how the region has responded to population decline relative to land use and um, how that is um, taking a look in some of the early graphics that we had looking at density across the 12 counties and how it has spread out and some of the ramifications of that um, as well as different things related to population and employment within the 12 counties. Anthony. Um, Mike, can you go back to that one screen? That one. So I noticed the, the color coding on the bars stick with the worksheet. Yeah, the, yeah, I didn't that. mention that. Yeah, the color coding on the bars does uh, indicate which work stream it came from, so you could always track which work stream you're in. Again, changes in population across the 12 counties, uh, trends over the last um, last years. Um, we're almost there. Yeah. No, I mean, we're almost there in the presentation. Oh. There is a search function. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Stuart. <laughs> Thanks. Um, the other theme in terms of spreading out, um, this again is related to the population decline, but really takes a look at how spreading out in the region has driven up costs uh, relative to transportation. And um, it made it so that it's very difficult to uh, get to job centers and to other places throughout the region without a car. Uh, so this one is heavy on a lot of the connections, work stream findings, um, but as well as uh, some of the findings related to the environment and how uh, the disband disbanding, abandoning um, brownfields and industrial sites has, has really um, become an issue within our region. Yeah, this one is on household costs and housing and transportation costs. I don't know if this one is linked to blow up correctly. This would be an interesting one to look at. No, I think it's too big. So, uh, uh, the housing and transportation index that we used for this um, was uh, is part of the Center for Neighborhood Technologies methodology, and it takes a look at your housing costs and your transportation costs as a percentage of your median in median income. And what they have found is that um, to be affordable, it would be 45% or less of your median income in terms of H plus T costs. Um, this map indicates the areas that are 45% or lower in the dark gray. All the rest of the region in terms of, a, I guess it would be a salmon color, <laughs> is 45% or higher. Um, the wonderful thing about purchasing the data from CNT is that uh, we can now drill down to different neighborhoods. We can drill down to different metro areas through the 12 counties. We could look at housing costs only. We can look at transportation costs. And I think, Kelly and Anthony, didn't we get 2000 and 2010? Didn't we get them both? Yeah, I think we can also do a comparison. I think this is 2010. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you have the data behind the maps. Is mm -hmm. there Yeah, yeah, and right now because of um, because we wanted to get these findings up because the findings not only serve for the interactivity on the website but also to fuel dialogue, we felt it was important to to get them forward in terms of kind of a flat image. But uh, there is a lot of data behind all this that we need to start calling through and putting together because what I am excited about is that people will be able to come to these sites and drill down to you know, how they are affected within where they live, not only housing and transportation, but we can add in some health things and different things that Neo Rio does, um, as well as different agencies throughout the 12 counties. So um, bear with us on that front, though. Um, Jeff. Jeff. Jeff, just a quick question. Yeah. Just to go back a little bit, you talked about zoning, the county zoning. Mm -hmm. 
please don't tell me that 11 counties have one county zoning map for all their area. No, here, let me explain what we've, what we've been doing. Um, every community has its own zoning, uh, its own zoning code and its own zoning map. Uh, and <clears throat> trying to, to generalize from that is a, is a, is a challenge. But we, working with, a, with a, an approach that AMAT's developed and looking at generalized land use and generalized zoning, across the, the four MPOs in Cuyahoga County, we developed a, a set of protocols for how to look at that so that we can look particularly at housing density because housing density relates very closely to, to, to transportation. Yes. You have to have a certain level of density to, su to support transportation. So we'll be able to look at, at the densities of housing and then general types of uses, uh, industrial, commercial, residential, agricultural, and the like. That will also allow us to do some, ma some, some match-ups to see in general terms how over or under zoned we are. Uh, we've been able to find, for instance, that a relatively small percentage of the region's land area is industrial, but we suspect a good deal more is zoned that way. Uh, and when we looked at one, we looked at, uh, several years ago at Medina County uh, and found that their zoning would accommodate a population two or three times the actual population, which was a piece of information local communities use to rethink where they, where they want to be. Uh, and many, many of our communities haven't had the opportunity to look at their zoning for many years. Other uh, grantees that, get, that, that are further down the line, such as Chicago's uh, 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 MPO, are actually taking information like that and working on, a, on a, essentially a contract basis with municipalities that want to take advantage of the opportunity to update their zoning. So this is really a first, first cut at, at a common understanding of what's in the cookbook about where, we, where we're headed. Mm -hmm. And I think it's already proved some fruit of its labor, right? Someone's already using some of the data or the zoning pieces of it? Or should I not have said that? All right, I didn't say that. Someone's borrowing You're something. Getting ahead, of us. getting ahead of the story. So the last two themes really focus on um, an evolving understanding. Uh, this first one was really uh, as uh, the work streams came together and looked at the data that was available, that there was a lot of data that is still missing and data that still doesn't tell the whole story. So this one really focuses on some of those areas that we really need to dig deeper and to find uh, and develop a better understanding of some of these conditions on the ground. Um, I know the one around uh, economic development and actual project costs is something that really is a, is a hot button and something that we really want to consider on how we can start to measure that going forward. So that's in there in terms of um, the environment. I think the brownfields are in there, just the lack of identification of where the brownfields are throughout the region, um, and then there's a few others. And then the last thing is continuing challenges. And this is a theme that we found where, you know, that we have done some work on, but we have continuing challenges in the region to meet um, as these um, solutions are developed or as um, problems still arise. And, and some of these challenges have been things that our region has been fighting against for a long time and trying to solve. And so uh, they contain a multitude of things from the different work streams as kind of continuing ch challenges that need to be met in the future. Um, with that, I guess I'm going to answer Stuart's question now. So, um, in the box on the upper right is a searchable tool. Um, so you can plug in, if you put in the word population up there, and then search through the posts. It'll give you all of the, um, all the population-related subject matter on the whole trends platform. Uh, this is still something that is kind of in development because right now it's searching the entire website, so you might get pieces of content in there too. But it is um, an interesting way to look at it. You can do it for you know, keywords such as cost, brownfields, health, um, and really start to hone in on different subject matters that might be more important or more critical to you. Other questions, comments? Jason? 
Well, Jeff, I think first I'd like to really commend you and the team from our strategy and the team from 427 Design that pulled all this together. Um, I think it's really impressive, especially considering when you talked about this at the last board meeting, um, the amount of data and information that's been pulled together in a relatively short time. And I know you guys have been working really, really hard on this. Uh, it looks great. So I, I wanted to uh, commend you for that. And I th one of the things that I find very exciting about this is um, you talked a little bit about some of the foundation work we've done, and you t mentioned the four kind of main work products that we hit on, which were um, a toolkit of best practices, uh, a dashboard to kind of let us know where we are as a region, um, pilot projects that might be able to flesh some of these themes out, and then policy recommendations. and. I think just for so everybody on the board kind of knows where this is going and the first part of my question was maybe to ask you to speak to that a little bit more but um, what this really enables us to do I think is to have a pretty good database to start to figure out um, for example when we put a dashboard together we have some great indicators here already when we might want to investigate different kinds of pilot projects we could be involved with some of these findings I think would help us to um, identify those um, so the first part of the question, I guess, was if you were able to just speak to maybe where some of this is going vis-a-vis um, -vis those products. The second part was some of us were talking today when we went out in the community and talking about how there's no substitute for seeing things with your own eyes and how I think another powerful thing about this platform is it pulls together some data that people can start to get an understanding of and then might lead to opportunities for people to go out and investigate things for themselves or lead to the other types of engagement that I think you're going to talk about later on the agenda. But I wondered if maybe, if you still remember the first part of my question, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a knack for this kind of thing. The second part was maybe to just talk a little bit about how this is used as an engagement tool because I, I noticed you have the join the conversation button and I think a lot of good opportunities and I'll well, shut up. I, I, I appreciate the thanks and so I, on behalf of 427 and our strategy um, you know you're welcome um, but a lot of this was really just based on the hard work of the project managers and the work streams really and that's to me and it just it was great to see you know all these organizations come together and and uh, I think uh, Mike Thomas will be happy that he and I aren't exchanging emails on Sunday morning at 6 a.m. anymore but um, but perhaps that will happen going forward. But um, <clears throat> I think this is the this is the subject matter that we're going to be talking about. This is what we need to engage the region in, not only within our board and and our executive committee and our work streams, but the greater region around these facts and and how they relate to our work. And I think all of that will infuse the dashboard. I mean, there are some things that are that are easy to pick on indicators, but there's also um, things here that are gonna spur conversation with the public that might change our mind about some of those indicators and, and kind of reposition them in a different way. And this is kind of the coming together of, of all the supporting information and the finding in information so that you can move forward and develop different plans and different strategies. It's, it's kind of the, the education that we needed to do on the region because it really hadn't been done in this fashion or comprehensively like this before. Um, I will also say that there are uh, other findings that the work streams have worked on that will be added to this. So this is not a limited universe of findings. Um, this is a learning process and will evolve. I think what we try to focus on is what are the five to six most impactful. But as we did that, it got to be seven or eight and, and, uh, and growing and growing. Uh, the challenge for us will be is to take all of this and to manage it into a process that we're developing a really comprehensive solution at the end. And I think this is going to set up some expectation as to what it is that we're analyzing in the next 18 months. But I think we need to take that challenge on and say these are the areas we're going to analyze. And this is what will be part of the deliverables at the end. So I think it will influence the type of tools that we developed. I mean, a great tool, as Emily said, would be just the interactivity of some of these maps. Another great tool with the zoning and land use map would be, you know, how is it we could put it on a site where people can just download quickly and make 
uh, decisions and, and related to some of this other work. And so there's a lot of different tools out there um, that we have to focus on and a lot of tools that are part of the HUD deliverable anyways that we need to do. And I think this helps us get that started. Um, to your second question, it is... I think today was, I, I wish we had videotaped the entire morning because it would be something that I think the whole board should have watched because it was really great to see people interacting around some of these issues here in the neighborhoods, particularly in Youngstown. And really it's that kind of learning that we need to spread. So as part of this um, platform in the future, uh, particularly the general public will be able to post photos and tell stories about how these issues relate to them. Because right now, if you're somebody, like if I gave this to my brother, he would say, well, it's a bunch of maps. What does it exactly mean to me? And so we need to work on that and also let them define it for us. So I think that'll be a significant part of what Patty's going to talk about. But um, all told, this will be something that's just building blocks that builds the dashboard and builds a kind of better region understanding. I think I got them both. Howard? Yeah, it may, your brother may be right. It is just a bunch of maps. But it's never been done before. No, no. And yeah, I, I, I no, believe I me, I don't discount the effort that we, that we got to get I here. I don't discount it at all. Of, I've seen many of trends and conditions uh, before. This is really terrific. Thanks. And, uh, it's one of the, probably the best that I've ever seen. Uh, you know, the, from the map from uh, Atlas to the collection of existing plans. You know, this, this is a top notch effort. Yeah. And what I'm saying, Howard, is that we just need to challenge ourselves not to just rest on this, but make sure that it's relatable to all the different audiences. Because it's really, and Patty will talk about this, it's really the residents and the elected officials coming together around this that's really going to be able to create change. And so we need to make certain that they understand these things in their terms and, uh, and they can do something about it. Dan? Yeah, I'd like to, uh, first of all, congratulate the uh, work streams and managers and uh, consultants who put this together, and especially you for your efforts. But one of the things I wanted to kind of stress was that the platform is the beginning of a regional conversation. It is not, it's not the end, it's not the end all be all. It's to generate discussion, sometimes even possibly contentious, but discussion based on fact. <laughs> not um, wishful thinking. So I, I think that's important in that it's the dynamic, mm -hmm. that it, it's not it's not static. It's it's going to change. New things are going to be identified, and that the information is useful to local officials. Right. The problem with local officials is they don't understand. They don't have people. They need to be able to zero in on data. They need to know to make decisions for all kinds of reasons, whether it be grant applications or planning or whatever. So I, I like the dynamic part. Of it. Well, and I do think we talk about products a lot and, and tools, and I do think what we need to, to do in the, in the future is really take a product development mentality and say, well, what is it the user, the final user within the government organization is going to really need this for and how we can best shape the development of that to achieve that. So it's not just that we are kind of comfortable in the, the typical tools or the traditional tools, but how we can kind of move that conversation forward. So. George. Um, as we move forward into the engagement process, if we're successful, I can imagine that the, the level and volume of traffic on the website and comments, suggestions, you know, if not properly managed, can swamp the thing. I just wondered how much how much conversation has been going on about capacity strategy to deal with this as a truly interactive uh, tool and and and. and uh, engage people in a meaningful way, not just sort of like uh, a surface way. Right. And I do think that, and we've talked about it with, uh, and Patty will touch on it a little bit in the engagement process. We've talked about it with our strategy and internally. I think it's almost a full-time person um, that's going to be curating this along doing some of our other social media and other kind of community outreach. Um, uh, maybe full time just curating this um, will come in in uh, in waves you know as we introduce new things, um, but as this gets out to the public, I think there there will be quite a bit of interest and uh, back to dan 's point is that um, you know we can 't be afraid of argument i mean there 's going to be people that really really disagree with what we 're doing and really really disagree with some of our findings, even if they agree with the overall purpose. And we need to find a way through online engagement and, um, and in-person engagement that embraces that dialogue. 
Um, you know, I don't want to spend all of our time online because I think most of the changes are going to happen in person. You know, and so we need to use our resources wise to manage this, but make sure we're doing parallel efforts on the ground, particularly in communities that don't have access to tools like this. So, Jason. You, you kind of touched on this, but could you talk maybe just a little bit more too about the strategy going forward on um, disseminating the information, letting people know about the site, maybe how that would interact to even having in-person meetings um, to engage. I, I know, for example, the Plain Dealer is interested in covering this now that it's released. I promised to tweet it to my you know, 90 followers on Twitter. <laughs> um, but like, I think there are probably other ways that you've thought about, because you're very good at that, of uh, engaging people, and if you could share a little bit about that. Well, I don't want to steal from Patty's Thunder, because she's going to talk about this and how okay, it fits so into the public the engagement time. plan. But I can say through the work, kind of the integrated work of our strategy and Patty, there's going to be, actually starting today at 3.30 or 4, quite a bit of push out on this. Um, in our social media channels, there's a lot of media here. Um, so there'll be a lot of uh, noise, if you will, made about this in the next week. And we do have a strategy to, to keep this moving forward uh, and to, to bring out as, as I said, some of the salient points of it. And we're meeting on Thursday with uh, Patty's team and, and Jeff's team to really focus on, so we have the findings, and now how can we get them into more of a digestible format so when we go out to have public engagement that that works. So, um, but, yeah, we, uh, I think at an executive committee meeting about a month or two ago, I said, you know, I'm just wedding, letting, waiting to let the dogs loose, and, and tonight the dogs are being set <laughs> loose. So it's going... It's going viral, you might say. So. <laughs> Other questions? No? All right, well, thank you. And, and really, um, the platform will only be as good as you guys visit it and make suggestions for it, so we want you to do that. You'll also be receiving probably sometime late tonight or early tomorrow kind of a templated email that you can share with your staff linking to this as well as your boards so that we kind of have some consistent messaging going out to all the different board members of our board organizations, um, as well as a pretty um, nice thank you going out to all the Workstream members tomorrow morning for helping to build it. So with that, I will conclude my discussion. Thanks. Okay, thanks a lot, Jeff. Uh, and I think it sounds like there's going to be some follow-up on this item on, on our very next uh, business item, which is 6-2, uh, uh, the engagement plan uh, cobalt contract. And we do have a resolution uh, before us to uh, um, enter into a contract with uh, the cobalt group. Uh, I believe Mike Lyons was going to cover that for us. So, Mike, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Jason. Uh, I and uh, Fred Wright are the co-chairs of the Communications and Engagement uh, Working Group. And we have, uh, I did want to make a few comments that I think are a little relevant to some of the discussion about, uh, we have uh, two consultants. One is our strategy, and uh, you've seen their work here. And the other one is the Cobalt Group, and you'll be considering approval of a contract with them uh, today. You have a resolution for that. Uh, and I just wanted to make uh, preliminarily a comment on both of them. Uh, when we went out to bid for these contracts, I think it was striking in both cases uh, how uh, their responses resonated with the purpose and intent of our whole project. And I just wanted to make a comment on that. And I think that is uh, displaying itself in the, in the work that both of them are doing. Our strategy was thrown in uh, at a time when we were, uh, when the uh, platform, and we called it a report at that time, was in the works. And they've been working, uh, really uh, put a lot of time in. I don't think we, we or they quite expected that that was the role they would play, uh, uh, really taking this, uh, this report, transforming it into a platform, and uh, then working it into the form that we have now. Uh, I think that was the only thing that could happen, given the situation. And uh, also, Joe Hadley and I were assigned to work with them and Jeff uh, Anderley on 
this work. We also received some feedback from the board on the findings. You may recall the uh, last couple of meetings, we went back and looked closely at those findings to determine whether they were really supported by, uh, by the data, whether they were phrased uh, that in a way that really reflected findings as opposed to opinion, that sort of thing. And I think that whole process was a, a very strong and, and positive refinement. So all of that uh, has gone into this so far. And, and underlying that has been all the work of the staff. The findings were based upon a tremendous amount of work at, at the staff level and the work stream level. So this has been uh, just, just so we have some sense that that what we have today is not, uh, is not just thrown together. This is, this is the culmination of our work as, a, as an effort so far. So, uh, and then the Cobalt Group, uh, our strategy is our communications consultant. Uh, and I just want to recognize Mike Thomas was here, uh, Jeff Rusnick, uh, are both standing back there just to recognize them. They have another associate here, uh, I think is John, uh, uh, he's in the other room, but I just want to just recognize them. Um, and with regard, one other comment, with regard to the data that we see uh, and the findings, uh, and some of the questions had to do, well, wh wh what is the underlying data that supports these findings and the maps? I think by putting this out as a set of findings, as supporting information, we are uh, really throwing out there for scrutiny uh, a lot of information, some conclusions, and uh, what we might also find is that people uh, might question the underlying information. A lot of the underlying information is based upon other studies that have been done. Uh, we might find that there are people who have additional studies that are either in, in the works or have been done that we haven't even uh, included in our information that might not be supportive or might be more supportive of the information. So uh, I think there are a number of levels uh, that we will be finding engagement. Uh, one might be a data level uh, of scrutiny on the data and then on the findings. Uh, and then the, another layer is the interpretation of that data. And this is a little bit what is moving forward. The findings are a little bit of an interpretation of the data. The themes that we've identified are, are an attempt to begin to see categories of the findings. Uh, and this is where a lot of work has to take place on, on the part of ourselves uh, in engaging others. So there's a, a heck of a lot of work that, that goes forward from here. Uh, and I think a lot of scrutiny as to what the work uh, is that we've done already. All right, now we switch uh, from our strategy, their focus of communications. Uh, now we switch to the Cobalt Group. And uh, I'm going to be introducing Patty Choby in just a second. She's going to run through their proposal. And we will be asking you, I think you all have a copy of a memo from the uh, Communications and Engagement Committee. We met last week uh, for several hours to go through in detail the proposal uh, from Patty Choby and the Cobalt Group. Uh, as she makes her presentation, I would just like you, uh, we're talking about the engagement consultant. Uh, this engagement, uh, you shouldn't think of it as we maybe normally think of uh, our MPOs have public engagement processes, our public bodies have public engagement processes. We generally approach those things as meeting an obligatory uh, requirement. Uh, this engagement process is not just to meet an obligatory requirement. This engagement process is to build capacity for this conversation that we've been talking about with the platform. So I want you to keep that in mind. This, this, uh, we expect co the Cobalt Group to be an integral part of the staff and an in integral part of the operation from this point to the end of the project. So as she presents, I just want you to be aware that this is not some separate effort from our core effort that's to take place out here. This, this, is a, this is a process that will be fully integrated into our staff process. It will be uh, fully part of the, the capacity building process that we contemplated when we first uh, got into this uh, whole project. Uh, so that's just a little bit of background. 
I'd now like to introduce uh, Patty Choby to go through her proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Patty Choby from the Cobalt Group, and if I haven't um, met any of you before you leave today, please introduce yourself to me because it's really important that I put your face and name together as we move this process forward. Um, I'm also going to go through a fairly quick presentation because I want to give you the benefit of having everybody in the room to inquire about how we're all going to be a part of this community engagement process as we move forward. Um, and, but before I get started, I want to thank the Youngstown team who has orchestrated today because this, again, is an example of how the community and engagement work stream wants to engage differently. And that work stream has been meeting and taking their charge very seriously. So it was really easy for our team, um, along with our strategy, to really step into a process of what is the best way to create dialogue in the region around action, not just engagement for engagement's sake, but to create an actionable agenda that will take this region far into the future in a much more collaborative way than we have worked in um, historical um, context. Um, everything that we have done in this process has been um, starting what we call the iterative process of community-based planning. Planning that is not linear, it is not parallel, it is really a big network of activities, ideas, resources, and people working to get things done. So when we entered the process, um, I tell my students this all the time, when you enter a community, history does not start the day you show up. You've got to understand what came before you. And what we did over the last two and a half months was really took the time to understand all the arduous heavy lifting that the work streams have been doing, that the project managers of the work stream have been managing, and what you all have been doing at this board level in order to try to figure out how we don't create a new organization per se, but we create a better and smarter way of everybody working together. So it was important for us to do a deep dive um, into the work stream activities and who was involved in those. Um, it was also important to understand that if we were going to design a community engagement process that is different than what we're normally used to, it was going to take us doing things differently. So we've got to change our behavior and we've got to look at what is the best way to engage not only the traditional elected officials, but residents and what we call in our line of work community experts, people who have experience, who have history, and who have solutions to many of the things that we talk about all day long. This diagram um, represents two things. One is if you look at the um, lower left-hand circle where the red dotted line is around, that represents sort of the traditional way of how community engagement has been done in this country. People have a meeting, they ask people to vision or talk about their needs or wants, people go away, and then somehow that information gets worked into a plan or some kind of initiative. What we're proposing with the NEOSCC process is a much more fluid, flexible, sustainable, and network approach to working at very local levels of our communities to more of the organizational level beyond and including the MPO level but then also being able to see at the macro level how all of this fits together. And the reason those three layers of community are important is that most of what happens in a community happens between people, one or two people or small groups of people. It's rare that you have, if your population of your city is 55,000, 55,000 people all at the same place in time understanding how you as an elected official or an agency director might be taking that organization. So what we're proposing here is a strong network-based approach where we look at the um, networks and the, and the networks of people that exist in the community, but we tie those conversations together between professional experts as well as community experts, and then look at how we take what the platform is allowing us to do in terms of sharing information and begin that learning and sharing process with other people in the region who may not be the usual suspects that you would talk to if you were doing a planning effort like this. Um, in a few short slides, I will show you sort of a network list of categories of people and organizations and networks that we are hoping to engage. 
But again, what is important to understand about this particular diagram is that given your time frame and limited resources and the scale and scope of the region, 4 million people, 12 counties, 18 months, $4.2 million, we have to quickly organize ourselves around people who are already organized. So the network approach will allow us to permeate our communities at different levels, at different times, and will allow us to really be true to um, the approach to equity that we want to take place, that we're not just going to talk to certain groups of people, but that we want to talk to other groups of people. And the second thing to remember about the network approach in building this network of networks is that in addition to all of the plans and the data that has been put onto the platform, there are going to be many other submissions by people and organizations who already have other pieces and parts of a final regional vision. So we need to not only use the platform to communicate what we know, we need to allow that platform to be a place where we can receive ideas, plans, and other best practices and information that can then roll up into a larger toolkit. So the strength of the network is that it is um, wide and diverse, and the strength of it is a strategy for community engagements. Engagement means that it will be sustainable past the 18-month period that you're embarking on. Um, the communication goals were given to us um, as a part of the RFP process, and we found absolutely nothing wrong with them and have adopted them wholeheartedly. Um, I think it is important to remember that when we are in the throes of talking to people and there's a lot of communication going on, we have to make sure that we're reaching out to people who may not be technology savvy, who may not be used to being engaged in processes like this. So we are accounting for that kind of time and outreach in the network of network building. We also know that we want to focus on opportunities. We want to create a dynamic um, set of ongoing relationships. And the only way we're going to create relationships is by spending time talking to and with people. Lastly, we really see that the platform that has been um, rolled out today will serve as a foundation, but just like every technology implementation project, you need to have people and a process in place to be able to effectively use that to technology and to bring people along that might not otherwise use that technology um, on a daily basis. So how do we take those goals and transfer them to a framework? Um, in addition to looking at a more technical logic model approach, which is something that we know is language that HUD is used to, um, we use those kinds of approaches in our work all the time, it is important just to put out values and a philosophy of approach. And so we've organized our efforts around the following um, items that you see on the slide. We want this to be transparent. We want it to be um, effective and accountable interaction among and between elected officials and um, leaders in the private and not-for-profit sector. It's collaborative. It's not top-down, nor is it exclusively bottom-up. It's really about those networks working together in a collaborative environment. We know there are a ton of in-kind and actual resources that we need to figure out how to leverage far beyond what you've already committed to as members of this organization. So it's not a 4.2 million project or a 5.7 million project. It is a long-term approach to leveraging investments in this community over a long period of time. Um, the other thing that we're going to introduce in a minute in more detail is that for us to be able to keep an eye on equity, environment, and economic development, we know that we have to have strategies for engaging people in small groups, on the individual level, with organizations and what their agenda and responsibilities are, and that somehow that does roll up into the larger regional vision. And to do that, we really are um, making sure that every community engagement activity is intentional, is in context, and supports the long-term goals of the organization to deliver what it has committed to delivering to HUD in 18 months. So as Mike pointed out, we're not having some parallel dialogue that you know, maybe people are coming in and out of what your work has been to date. This has got to be hand in glove so that the engagement informs the next steps and decision making that happens at the staff and the board level. What I want to do real quickly is get to the components of the community engagement plan and then talk about how the next six months is going to roll out. 
So um, on this slide, you will see that we're sort of starting out with an integrated project management approach, which is what we've really been doing to date, trying to figure out how what the communications consultant and what staff have been doing begins to inform the community engagement piece. We also know that social media strategies will be um, deployed because we do need to reach as many people as we possibly can, and because social media strategies are built on social networks, that's how we permeate the region and its, and its um, very diverse sets of, of um, networks. We will have um, many meetings and dialogues, and I'll get to that in a minute about sort of how we kick off this process, but we're going to use those dialogues to get to the next level of public engagement and to what will happen in the 12 months in 2013. We also know that um, we will be working alongside staff. Um, some of their time is going to be committed to reaching out to not only the current people that they've been working with to create the existing conditions and trends report, but with new people who want to become a part of this process. How do we quickly onboard them so that they can become just as um, engaged in the dialogue in moving forward. So the idea is to reach out to a large group of people quickly, board, get them on board to, with what we're doing, and then figure out how what they do and how what their networks are fit into the overall strategy. I think the other thing that um, will be important for us to figure out as we're going through that process is how do we continue to use technology and build the capacity of people in the region, in the region to use technology. So we're not just going to be um, searching for some cool engagement technology because somebody said we should use it, or it was listed in another city's plan for um, the Sustainable Communities Initiative. We're going to use technology um, once we see how people use the platform, what they're asking for, what their capacity is, and the idea is, is that the people in the process will drive the technology decisions. So in the budget, you'll see that there is money set aside for that, but we, at this state, aren't exactly sure what those different tools will be, although we have a general idea of how we're going to integrate them. There are other things like the 12 counties in 12 months, the um, Vibrant Neo that Jeff spoke to um, with the platform. We also have a concept for a small grants program that we'd like to use to leverage not only local money, but to spark some innovation and get different people within a region to, or within um, the region to work together. We know there are going to be people who are calling us and saying, I want to volunteer. We have to have a process in place that will allow them to connect and volunteer to things that are um, meaningful to them, um, accessible to them, and um, help them understand how, as one person on the ground, they fit into the larger vision for the region. Um, and lastly, there has been a lot of talk among the consultants and staff about trying to figure out how we, at some point in the second half of this engagement process, really create some kind of regional collaboration um, day, celebration, something that allows us to understand where we are at the project um, at that moment in time and how collectively across the region acknowledging the hard work that has been done does take us to another set of milestones and another set of implementation strategies um, for the plan. So this is just an example of the list that we have been compiling with regards to the network list that we have been building. I think the slide says there's about uh, 609 um, people that are part of some kind of network in the region. The number, I think, on the list is upwards of 750 now, and that list is going to continue to grow. The strategy here is to make sure that we can quickly and effectively reach out to a broad array of people using things like webinars, using um, group emails, using other people's network tools. Um, there are organizations throughout the region that are specifically tied to a specific type of activity in the region. So our, our over overarching approach is to really look at the existing conditions platform, figure out how to drive traffic to it, and then begin to create a dialogue around what does that platform say, how do people want to interact with it, and what does it mean to the networks of people that we are organizing. So it'll be everybody from the folks who are planting gardens around St. Pat's with Father Noga to people who are worried about the privatization of the Ohio Turnpike. You know, it could be that diverse 
of a set of networks that we will ultimately engage in. And that's why this integration with both staff, the work streams, board members um, is important because we know the diversity of people is going to be huge and we need to be able to do that in a cost effective way in a short amount of time. As we're doing that process, this diagram represents what we're going to be doing in that process to move people's questions, ideas, and issues into the tools and the other deliverables for the project and ultimately into a plan that is comprised of opportunities that's based on our assets and strengths and that really does hit on in a very direct way the challenges or constraints that we might feel today sitting in this room because we don't have this story connected at the highest level yet. So the example of, um, you know, if we're talking about whether it's transportation or roads or environments or brownfields, um, the idea here is that as we're hearing those things, we literally plot them on this graph to make sure that we can, if it's an issue at the highest level, make sure that the right people are engaged in the, in the conversation and in the pro problem solving. And if it's at something at the very local level, that we've got the right community experts. So um, the professional disciplines and the community experts that will come to bear also become part of the iterative process to engage people in solving problems, creating solutions, and leveraging what we have in the region to leverage. So over the next six months, what we intend to do is to um, first, in addition to what Jeff was talking about with trying to figure out the best way to continue to enhance the platform, we will quickly try to reach out to as many people and as many network leaders as possible to begin to get an understanding of what are the other things that we need to do with the platform to make it usable and how do we engage those leaders both in listening to them and receiving feedback not only for the work that's been done to date, but things that will add to that dialogue and problem solving. The young leader events, which have already started, there'll be another round of those, um, actually two more rounds before the end of the year. Those events are also gaining um, a lot of momentum because as the young leader said on a phone call the other night, um, we don't wanna just sit around and talk. We don't just wanna be convened in a meeting. And explicitly, they talked about not wanting to be seated at the kids' table. They really want to be viewed as equal partners and adults. And just like when we talk about equity and we have issues around social equity, I think we have um, an issue of age equity that we want to make sure we address and that we put those young leaders to work in the most meaningful way possible. The other thing that will happen over the six-month period is we will very quickly get to what does the create phase look like. So what we'll be trying to figure out as we go through these different engagement experiences, really figuring out if we really want to engage people around creating the vision, what is the most um, logical way to do that? How do people want to be engaged? And how do people help us get to that phase so that 2013 begins to see a set of real deliverables um, coming out of both board and staff work, um, but also out of the engagement of people in the community. These will be the deliverables for the six month period and um, I believe the resolution that's before you is talking about spending up to the, um, the one amount of I think $126,000. Um, 50,000 of that money has not been determined in terms of how we are actually going to spend it. It will be done in tandem with the work streams and staff and the board so that we can make sure that um, Everybody is having their needs met with regards to the community engagement. And part of that process is really getting a commitment from people in the region to be a part of this process. So by the end of December, as we're standing at our sixth traveling board meeting, let's say it's going to be in Lake County, we will know specifically what the engagement process will look like. We will know who's committed and at the table. And we're going to know what their engagement is going to be um, in the next 12 months of the project. We know that there will be a new dialogue within the region. People will be talking about this process because they are going to be engaged in it. We also know that we will have metrics that we will use to measure the effectiveness of the community engagement in a way that allows us to um, not just measure did we deliver what we told HUD we were going to do, 
we're really going to be looking for opportunities to change the way we work together so that this is sustainable after the 18-month period. There will obviously be updates to the conditions and trends platform, so that will be another major outcome. And getting back to um, the graph with the issues and opportunities, we hope to broaden that dialogue and to be able to have a lot more specificity around when we talk about the data that was presented today in terms of existing conditions, that we've changed the dialogue from here is what our region looks like today to a more specific dialogue around this is what we're doing in our region to um, create a better environment, to make quality connected places, to deal with issues of affordability, and to bring it all together in one large vision. And I think the thing that is so um, important to take away from this particular meeting today is that um, while for some of us in the room, a unified land use or zoning map may seem like, why haven't we done this before? I think it's a perfect example of, let's not ask how to do something, let's ask why it hasn't been done, and then figure out how to do it. Because I am convinced that everybody in this room knows how we can make this process better. We need an engagement process aligned with the content that's being, um, and the work of the work streams um, to be brought together so that at the end, there is actually action happening and the community engagement process is designed to fuel that and inform it and make sure that we are on track to be accountable for the deliverables that the initiative was set up to deliver in the first place. Ooh, last slide. So information, input, priorities from the public to inform and push the dashboard, tools development and other products, in addition to building the network of networks, are really what we're trying to do in the six months. And for any of you who've done community engagement, the, um, is it? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you'll know that this is, this is like a, a large undertaking, but it's possible because of the number of people who want to be engaged in this kind of process. And it's possible because of everything that you've done over the last 12 months to tee up this moment in time. And it's exciting, and we're really glad to be a part of the process. Howard. Thank you. Uh, ultimately, you're going to end up with thousands of opinions on thousands of issues from thousands of people. Uh, this is probably the largest community engagement process I see. Right. How, how will it all be prioritized? I don't see that in here. Um, a little and, and also, you know, one of the follow-up things, you know, what's the role of the elected officials in Right. Um, so let me get to that question first, and then we'll talk about the larger management process. Um, one of the reasons why the project managers are being engaged very intentionally in this process is so that there is a constant, um, take the elected officials, for instance. I think there's, what, 140? 100 and, right. So if we set out to meet with every one of them separately, it would take us 12 months to do that. We will need to work smartly with the elected officials at the table, which is where this community engagement starts, and then reach out through the different activities and networks that they have. So case in point, we met with Mayor Brenda last week to go through um, what community engagement looks like, what a meeting in um, Lorain County might look like. There were three or four things that she said she could do individually to help us reach out into different places in Lorain County. Now, if we just asked her to do that by herself, she might not have the knowledge, she might not understand all the things that the work streams have understood or the project managers have understood, but that process will be designed so that she has the messaging, can reach out to those people, and then those individuals are then integrated into other conversations that are happening as we move forward. So we're not going to be talking individually to thousands of people. We will be talking more strategically to maybe a couple thousand over the course of the next 18 months. And then relying on those networks and how they engage, continuing to enhance the platform so that there is both two-way dialogue and enhancements being made to it as people share information with us 
and then constantly running that information through the filter of what the work products and the other deliverables are, both from a board and a staff perspective. Give you an example uh, of a problem. Uh, <coughs> bicycling, very, very popular right. uh, in lots of areas. I'm sure many people uh, that would be engaged you know, would promote it. It's also very unpopular in other areas as well uh, for a whole host of reasons. Right. And the, uh, you know, where does it, you know, how do you go from all those opinions to, you know, to an action plan? Well, I think the first step, and I haven't looked at the, the detailed list of the plans that have been collected to date, is um, much of that work has been done by the work streams and by the project managers in terms of collecting existing plans and identifying existing efforts that are underway to address, say, an issue like um, biking. Um, I think that there are processes that the work streams have currently when they take an issue and... There's a discipline in terms of starting to drill down to it. There will need to be, if bicycle, just say the bicycle plan for Northeast Ohio becomes a priority for this process, there will have to be an engagement process, not only around what's existing, but how that particular item fits into the overarching deliverables. Um, I mean, I can think of off the top of my head right now, there's three groups of people um, around the region who are addressing this issue, and every issue cannot become an NEOSCC issue, but every issue can be integrated into the conversation, which is why the Trends and Conditions platform is so important. It is not about creating this hierarchy or the funnel where we're just going to dump a lot of opinions and perspectives into it and then see what comes out. It really is about choosing to have intentional conversations with those entities and those networks that can join the process, be productive, and ultimately drive some kind of conclusion around those particular issues, which is why for us to sit here and say, what does 2013 really look like? It's really hard to say until we really see what is the level of commitment and what type of commitment from different organizations and networks will be willing to join in this effort. John? Can you speak in more detail to the equity side of this? I guess I'm still, I mean, hearing networks of networks, but we're talking right. about individuals who don't have networks or support who are the ones that often get left out. So could right. you give more detail on sure. role? Sure. Um, an example of that, over many years of work in different communities, um, we have worked with a lot of low and moderate income populations. Um, sometimes they're isolated in pockets in the community, sometimes they're more fully integrated. Um, within those kinds of uh, demographics, you also have um, age differences. You've got elderly, you've got um, young families with kids, you might have single moms with kids. So the idea there would be to um, identify, first of all, by working with local elected officials and other entities, where are the organizations that have the ability to engage those groups of people, and then to determine what's the best way to talk about transportation to a mom whose child receives support through Head Start. So the issues that we're talking about here at the highest level of the region are experienced the same, or, or I should say are experienced by everybody, they're just experienced differently. So the issue with the bike uh, folks may not be the same issue that um, you know a single mom who needs to get her kid to childcare so she can get to work, but by understanding that you've got to talk to different people in the community, you are going to have different strategies and approaches to solving transportation issues, um, particularly getting to Hunter's point earlier about um, you know, density. You, know, you have to start the conversation somewhere, and I think that um, the equity issues um, will be, I think they've been identified in a lot of your existing and conditions um, data, but they need to be discussed from a different perspective, and that perspective also has to take into account the fact that um, there are going to be different ways of engaging people. So 
Um, I'm trying to think of a, something that we've just done recently. Home-based child care providers. There has been, this is, a, this is a good example of how policy misdirects and misinforms local funding. We've had a project going on for many years where we've been trying to figure out um, why all the literacy issues and early childhood dollars in the state continue to not benefit the people that they were designed to benefit. Well, after much consternation and lots of research, we figured out that in most communities, there is either A, not the budget, or B, the market that has been designed to be served prefers not to have their children take advantage of those programs. So the bulk of children are being served in homes, sometimes by qualified home-based care providers, sometimes by just family members or friends. So there's a huge disconnect between the money that has been set up to actually engage families, educate young children, and the way in which to get to that demographic of people is not to go to the child care centers because that's going to be a minimum number of people who are actually engaged. It's to go to the home-based care providers and to work through those networks in the community because while much of the academic research will tell you that people in isolated, low-income, minority communities do not have networks, they're wrong. They have different kinds of networks and that's why it's important for us to work with providers who understand what's going on and then enable us to be able to, and, and it may not be anybody from this group. It may be an engagement with that group that says, we know transportation's an issue, or we know affordability for housing is an issue. We first have to ask, what have they been doing to address that and talk about it, and then engage what could the larger body of NEOSCC do to make that issue a common issue between those two groups of people and something that we can actually define in a, as an issue and it just doesn't remain a larger problem. And I know it was like a long-winded explanation. But I think it is really important that we understand that networks, um, they grow and they develop over time and that regardless of what community you identify yourself with or that you live in, you are living in a world of networks. And there are people that we can use to get to those networks. Jason. Uh, jumping back to, to what Howard said for a second with the example of, say, bicycling, something that their bike advocates are some of the strongest advocates that are out there for something. Uh, there are a lot of people, on the other hand, that you know view them differently and don't want bikes anywhere near. I think just from my where I come from with your role and our role as the board, I see what the Cobalt Group is helping us do is gather a lot of information, distill it down, um, and help advise us. But I think the hard choices of actually deciding, for example, if any OSCC decided that we want to make biking a big priority and we want to recommend that the region create 100 more miles of bike lanes over the next 10 years, I think the only people that can make that decision is this board. You know, I think the, the, the work that you're gathering is key and critical, but I think if I understand your role, it's not necessarily that you're going to tell us what we need to do. I think that's on, on our shoulders. Uh, you could advise us and certainly provide us with good data, but I think if this works well, and I think it will, um, you fulfilling that role and then we kind of stepping up in our role as decision makers and strategists on regional policies, that's what right. we have to fulfill. And because of the capacity building nature of what um, the organization has taken on, there are sort of three areas where we will be helpful. One is helping you understand how this network of networks approach plays out and helping working alongside of you to understand that and to do that as in terms of fulfilling your board level responsibilities. The second thing is to help build the capacity of other organizations that we come into contact with about what all this existing conditions and trends activities are for, and that's where we will continue to work with our strategy in terms of messaging and distilling things to a very simple layperson's um, type of language. And the third will be to continue to help you be better informed leaders. Um, it would be one thing to have, say, half of you want bike, another 100 miles of bike lanes in the region, you know, we could go out and find five bike groups to come here and advocate for it, or we could find five groups who don't want to advocate for it. And to Howard's point, you know, you get 100 people in the room, you're going to have 100 different um, perspectives. 
Um, our job in this process is to keep things focused around the dialogue that will inform the products, <coughs> that will help you make informed decisions. But most importantly, at the end of the 18 months, there is action. It is not a static plan. It's not a compilation of plans. It will be informed action. And it will be at the micro level, and it will be at the macro level. Uh, yes. Uh, let me preface my, I'm going to be a little contrary in here, but let me preface this by saying I wasn't a member of the, the engagement committee, so I'm coming at this kind of fresh. Uh, but I did have sticker shock when I looked at, at this uh, in engagement for $126,000 over uh, the course of the next six months. Uh, I, I'm thinking of it just, we just got a $100,000 grant from the state, I and mean, we worked for months to get a grant which is going to, to work on that merger study that we're working for communities. We're going to have to make that stretch over probably two or three years. And to see us using $126,000 over six months, I mean, it, it was a shock to my system. Um, I'm also, I, I look at, at, we don't have a plan. We don't have anything to present to people other than terms and conditions. So we're not going out to the public at this point. It seems almost premature because we're not saying we're thinking of going in this direction or that. All we have is raw data. And we're just saying, this is, you know, we've, we've lost jobs in manufacturing, we've gained jobs here. We have these strengths, we have these assets, we have these deficits. I don't know what the public's supposed to do with that at this point. And I've been in so many meetings where you put the charts up and, and people spend two hours and they put their ten top concerns in and, and God knows whatever happens to those papers. Um, I looked at the terms and conditions thing. There are a lot of sophisticated people in this room, a lot of experts, and yet what was on the screen today was really stuff that was drawn from even more expert people like Ned Hill who spent a lifetime on these issues. What are we going to get out of this process? I mean, we're going to go out and engage these networks and talk to people. <coughs> what are they going to tell us that the head of a bicycle association or a social worker or someone in you know, Ned Hill's staff couldn't give us 99% of what the, what's out there? So what are, what are we trying to accomplish by spending $100,000 now, maybe $300,000 over the course of, of three years, to talk to people? And when you look at that list of networks, how diluted is their input going to be when you're talking about it, you know, urban gardeners, bicyclists, architects? Uh, what, how are they going to inform this process to the point that in a year and a half we're going to make some concrete decisions based on what? Uh, based on their input? or based on the work of Ned Hills of the world? And are we, you know, should we direct our expenditures to getting expert advice or to doing input from the public that I just see will be so diluted that I don't know what it adds dramatically to this process? So. Well, in addition to, um, I shouldn't say in addition to, the public input piece is not just about listening to what people have to say and say we're just exclusively asking them to respond to the conditions and trends platform. It's about soliciting their engagement in what they're doing, how it fits into the bigger picture, and take the first uh, category on the list, the architects. If we choose not to engage architects, we'll be dead in the water. You know, we need to understand how different disciplines and different community experts' experiences contribute to our way of life in the region. And if a room of experts or a study from CSU could solve our region's problems, there wouldn't have been a need for any OSCC. So the shift we're making here, the behavior change we're making here, is we are engaging a broader group of people around specific things that are already underway in the region that somehow link and tie to the different work stream activities. So that at the end of the 18 months, you don't have a bunch of flip charts with you know, stickers on it. And all we've done is ask people what we should prioritize. I mean, I think there have been enough initiatives in the region to tell us, um, and Mayor Brenda said this the other day, jobs. Her number one issue. People in her community 
need to understand how is this related to jobs. So that's one example of one major issue. We'll get the same thing about education. We'll get the same thing about transportation. We know as experts there are a few key things that continue to hamper our region's quality of life, success, and growth. It's not those major problems that we're trying to tackle. It's all of the opportunities and issues and assets that we need to leverage that we're trying to pull together. Because the studies tell us what the problems are, they're not telling us, per se, what the actual strategy is for working with people around a common set of issues that people are committed to. And if we don't take the time to talk to those broad networks of people, we're never going to find the folks in southern Mahoning County who've already just taken it upon themselves to st stripe a mile of uh, country road for a bike lane. We really have to take the time to understand what is happening. And I think, again, we haven't finished our tour here in Youngstown today, but for those of you who were on the tour, this is a perfect example of taking a snapshot of a community, looking at the networks of people that are here, and figuring out how do we take some of the best practices that they're, do they're already doing on Parkview Avenue um, in the Idora neighborhood. That is the essence of the engagement piece, because if we don't build off of what we're already doing, we get into that vicious cycle of just talking about with what's wrong with ourselves, what's wrong with our neighborhood, what's wrong with our region. And for those of us who've done enough planning processes at a county or a regional level, we know how diverse every county is, which is why we have to be far-reaching in our engagement strategy. Um, but we're also not managing to an end in terms of comparing it to the, the process that you're talking about um, with uh, the merger, the communities merging. That has a very specific process. Um, there will be four or five different experts that can say you can approach it from a legal standpoint. There might be a community perspective. There might be a resource perspective. There might be a county perspective. We are talking about managing multiple perspectives. And the only way for us to do it authentically is to start talking to people about what they're doing, what they see is what's right with the region, and where those assets are that we can leverage and begin to understand how they play into market opportunities, job creation, improving the quality of life, and addressing transportation issues. And, and just to quickly respond, I, I just guess I'm skeptical that, I mean, this process has been going on for what, 12 months, 18 months? Uh, I mean, it's been staffed for 12 months. Okay. Well, staffed for about nine. Actually. And how we're going to get any depth of knowledge, when you look at that list of, of networks, when you're talking about bicyclists and architects and single moms and urban gardeners, and, and to try to, in the next 18 months, considering what we've done to date, to try to dig down into all those groups and pull out something that's going to be impactful to what we conclude, I, I'm just highly skeptical that the process will, will get, the, get any information that's going to be of great value for this process. I have a comment that um, I think I've actually taken out pieces of this and used it for RFP for public engagement at RTA because I think it's well done, I think it's well rounded, and I think that you're not just informing the public in a traditional manner like we've done for the last 20, 30 years. You're trying to start a dialogue to continue on for the next 12 years. And if you can get one spark of something from someone, you never know. I got somebody telling me they wanted a span of buses, the time between buses on a shelter. Who knew that? I wanted to give them a whole schedule. I want to do it electronically. They don't want that. I think it's well-rounded. I think $126,000 is not a bad, given all you're going to be doing in the six months, I fully support it from RTA and from transportation. Just a, just a couple of points, Ed. I think two, two things. First, this is a very large region. This is 12 times Cuyahoga County. So, this, uh, so in terms of just a budgetary scale, I'm not terribly concerned with that, given, the, given where the size of the state of Connecticut. This is the large area. Uh, secondly, I think uh, we committed in the no in right response to the NOFA, and I, I don't want to speak for Howard and, and Jason and others who put it together, but there was a very strong commitment from the very beginning to 
engage people who are not normally engaged in the traditional process by which we all do a community engagement and fall asleep. So the idea, <laughs> you know, this is what we do for a living, you know, okay, in church basements. I mean, the, the fundamental idea is a network of networks, which gets to the third point. This is an accelerator. We have spent time putting in place the basic tools. The tra platform gives us a depth of bench in terms of what already is known. Each one of those platform observations has a range of data behind it and an opportunity to add to that. I think what we're going to see if we, light the, if we connect this network and light it up is the sort of acceleration of change across a region that does not happen now because we don't know each other and have no way to do so. People don't know what's going on in Adora Park and how that impacts what could happen in Slavic Village and vice versa. And we've seen this in very modest ways, but very important ways down the land bank discussion between Cleveland and Youngstown and Flint, Michigan, when we start thinking about a network of common areas and then talking with Holly Brenda. I'm, I'm encouraged by the, by the construct of this, which is one that relies on our common shared knowledge and connects the dots. And again, in terms of the scale of it, I'm not terribly worried dollar-wise. In terms of the, the, the timing, it's a challenge, but I think this, this region is up to that challenge. And I think every piece we put together, let, let me give you just one example. And that's the land use. It was a zoning map, Howard. How long did it take us to do the zoning map before? A year. For one county, or for five counties. We've done that zoning map in about three months. Because the technology is there now that NOACA didn't have 10 years ago. I think we're going to be surprised. I think we're going to be surprised. I just want to say, I, I think um, the, this part of the process is the most critical. And, you know, when you mentioned, you, you had mentioned in your comments, you know, we already know this. Who's the we you're talking about? I know a lot of people who do not have any familiarity with what's in that platform that need to be engaged somehow. And one of the things that uh, really kind of uh, annoys me in, about the, the, the whole process is we're so fixated although we should be as to what the deliverables are to HUD. And we forget that this is so much bigger than what HUD is providing us with right now. And, you know, and I appreciate uh, your, uh, your, your view of looking at it as this is a, a considerable dollar amount and we have this time. I'm so sick of just thinking constantly about the time and not looking at sort of the substance of what we can get as far as really understanding what people in Northeast Ohio value. This is going to be really a value question that really is going to eventually lead to driving policy. And for so long, and this is why you have like uh, a lot of these uh, organizations and decision makers making decisions in the back vacuum because they're always handcuffed by time and regulations. And we never get an opportunity to really dig down deep and go to the, the, the level that we need to go to. So for me, uh, if I were voting now, I would vote to proceed with this engagement strategy just for the simple reason that we've never taken a leap ever at this level. And I guess this is why we're here, to sort of take these risks and really begin to sort of test, you know, our 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 uh, 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 our situation here in Northeast Ohio to, to see what we can pull out of this thing. I'm just so sick of the skepticism, man. I can't, I swear, I don't want to come to another meeting when I hear, <laughs> you know, um, hear people being worried. I mean, you should have been worried from day one. It was only a three-year grant. But I mean, you just need to just roll the dice and just move. And just move. Yeah, I think the other thing is, to be frank, you were spending the money to set it back. You set it back. And believe me, they're going to pay you right back. Well, I just like, I'd just like to close my comments um, by telling you a story that happened last week when um, the art strategy team and um, Jeff Anderley and the folks from Civic Commons were talking about the Young Leader events and we've got them scheduled, the word's out there, dates are on the street, now we need locations, agendas, whatever. And I happened to run into a colleague of mine who's my contemporary, um, who's the head of an organization that does housing rehab and, lo and loans money. And she's talking to a guy who's 25-ish, uh, had bought 
a building, rehabbed it, moved his, moved his offices in. Um, I told him he, you know, invited him to the meeting in Cleveland. He goes, I don't go to meetings. This is what I'm trying to do. Can you help me? <laughs> and in literally five minutes, standing in a restaurant on the west side of Cleveland, we figured out how his two kids that are working in a garden are going to come and interview my mother about a certain kind of horticulture that's meant to be produced at scale so that he can take that back and teach the kids how to grow those products at scale in an urban neighborhood, giving kids jobs. That is the essence of Network of Networks. And all I have to do is make my mother available for about 12 hours of videotaping because the guy also produces documentaries. And my mother will be happy to do that for free. So that, that to me, is, is huge. And that's really what we're talking about. And um, you will find lots of moments like that as you go through this process if we adopt the network of network approach. My suggestion is chairs, that we get a motion on the floor because we're going to lose our quorum. I'd so like to make a uh, motion uh, to approve uh, the uh, resolution uh, on this uh, uh, engagement contract. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Um, I would like to make a suggestion on the resolution, and I think because I'm chair, I can't make a motion, so I'll throw this out for maybe someone to make uh, a motion on. But I do think because the original amount was the $394,000, which is mentioned in the resolution, um, we don't mention anywhere in the resolution the $127,760. Uh, so I would suggest that we edit the, the whereas um, that's underlined toward the bottom to say only the first six months of the plan are authorized for release of payment uh, in the amount of 127760 So my suggestion is basically yeah, the... I would move to amend the resolution to include the language that Jason just added. Second. Second. All right, so I think our procedure is... I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. Well, I think procedurally, let's go ahead. We have a motion and a second on the I'm amendment. Sorry, I second the motion. It's a friendly amendment, so it's accepted by the seconder. If it's friendly, then it's working. Okay. Good. I have a question there. Can I? Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay. Is the contract then for the one twenty six? The con the language approving the three hundred some thousand dollar contract is still in there. The 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 one hundred twenty six is added to the language added that. That only that amount, only the first six months is released. We're just adding a dollar amount to that release. So it's in that resolution. My only concern is that the resolution is what goes to HUD to authorize the draw, and if there can't really be two amounts in there. Mm -hmm. they need to I think we need to be specific, though, about what amount of money we're talking well, about. They may only well, how are you going to release yeah, well, the contract? Is for the, the, the contract. The invoices. The, con or the contract stipulates how it will be spent. For instance, if so, even if you even if you get the three ninety four, and they don't do what they supposed to do for one twenty six, then the contract will be terminated, and there won't be no one any further. So I, I don't I don't have a problem in the one three ninety four, but the contract stipulates how it's going to be. How it's going to be dispersed? The contract. Six, six. The first one twenty seven what is it is in six months. They reach that goal, then we release. Yeah, I think my intention in suggesting that was just for clarity. That that's all. I'm not worried about the the amount in the contract. But she made the point. She made the point that that if we don't put the the three ninety four in the resolution, it would be hard to do it down. I'm not suggesting that we not have the 394. I'm just suggesting that we have additional detail. No, I'm suggesting that we do not put the additional detail because the additional detail is outlined in the contract that we're adopting for 394. It's, it's all there. Okay, if, if, if that's the consensus, you can withdraw the second. If it's not, then we should vote on that. Well, I agree with her. If you give HUD two numbers or
big statistic. Uh, yeah. but, so what you're saying is they would only release the 127? I'm just saying that we the resolution needs to be very clear on what the full amount is. We can put it any It is very clear on what the full amount is. No, but I'm saying that if they see a resolution for two different amounts, it creates that challenge as far as what is the purpose. I was just trying to do what I thought was making a helpful suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies to the board. With, 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 with regard to that, Mr. Chairman, I think the staff is fully fully aware of the intent of the chair and the members that the language of the contract be adhered to, and we will come back with a second set of resolutions at the end of this of successful conclusion of phase one. Okay, this phase. Right. It sounds like the consensus is that we're okay without that amount. So <laughs> let's go ahead and vote on the, the whole call thing the and be done with it. I call the question. You got to vote. Yeah. <laughs> all, all, uh, all in favor of approving the resolution as written, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? We have one no. Uh, motion carries. Thank you. I think that takes us to the last item, which is uh, update on the HUD visit, and then the next item's adjournment, so we're almost there. Um, the attorney who is our government technical representative, Grant Rupp from HUD, will be in town the week of July 2nd, and we have a tentative time. I just have to confirm it with him for Thursday, July 5th, from 1 to 3 p.m. in Akron at the office. office to have a sit down with him to go over our progress to date, where we're going to go from here. So if you're interested in attending that meeting, if you wouldn't mind just um, letting the office know. Otherwise, uh, Executive Committee members and staff have been invited to do it. Who, who, is, who is it going to be? It's the attorney. <coughs> He's kind of our liaison with HUD in Washington. Or, or If I could just add, the importance with the HUD visit as well is as things are being realigned is to ensure that HUD has the clear communication from this board as far as future activities, how work is being deployed and everything like that, just to make sure everybody's comfortable. Given that we're going to have some pretty significant documents to submit to them in the next month, that we need their full understanding and cooperation so they can approve those and let us keep moving. Um, so that communication is just very clear. So, and Sarah, I am free that day. So, yeah. Um, one last thing I wanted to recognize Mayor Samron of uh, Youngstown for uh, coming today to join us. So thank you, sir, for joining us and give you a chance to say a few words I'm if you'd like. Say much. I talked all day. I'm just here to say hi. They told me it was a social, so I came for the social. <laughs> We're almost there. I hope the meeting's over. <laughs> you can call the question, Mayor. Thanks for joining us. All right, if there's not anything else further business-wise, we're adjourned. We're adjourned.